I uh, go to my prayer closet as I always do before I, I, I serve God in this way and I say, Lord, it's Mother's Day. Let's preach a great Mother's Day message. And uh, I prayed and I, I always like to wait for the Lord to kind of give me the message. And in my prayer, I was saying, I was making these suggestions like, what about Mary, the mother of Jesus? That was an incredible mother, raised her carpenter son and watched him get crucified. And what about, what about Mary? And I got nothing. It was just like, just, just wait. And then the days go by. And I like to have a lot of time to prepare. I might only be here for 40 minutes, but I spend hours <laughs> in preparation and praying and worshiping. And so I just kept worshiping God. I kept praying and saying, Lord, give me the message. Nothing. I said, well, what about this other? There's so many great women of God in the Bible. Let's get this Mother's Day thing going. And the days were clicking by. And then the weeks were going by. And then I started getting a little anxious. Like, uh, time is running out here. And Lord, you haven't given me the message. And I'd go sit in my office. I'd turn down all the lights so I wouldn't be distracted. In the dark, sat on my chair, cranked up the worship. And I worshiped and I worshiped and I prayed and I prayed. And nothing, 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 nothing from God. And then finally, hallelujah. God said, Paul, it is not about you. See, I was trying to tell God that we were going to do a Mother's Day message. And I was asking him to tell me which one of the Mother's Day messages that I had decided we were doing did he want me to preach on. And God doesn't work that way. And you see, for me, and I'll tell you a little of my personal story, I've spent 25 years in sales. And in this world of sales, it's all about me. It's it's this, I call it I society, not high society, but I society. And I hear it a lot in the language, you know, well, Paul, for me, this is what I think. And it's all I, 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 me, me, me. And I spent 25 years in this world in my career. And it was, you know, I read books like Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Great book, but it's all about me and what I can do to succeed in life on my own strength. I, I listen to Zig Ziglar tapes. Jim Rohn's one of my favorites. My family laughs at me because I can recite them. I've listened to them so many times. I can drive my car and just start talking and sounding like Jim Rohn. I've listened to so many of them. I had a, a sales book and my big red sales book and right on the front cover in big bold letters. This is what I wrote. This was my motto. 25 years in, in sales, it said, live like no one else so that one day you can live like no one else. And it was a slogan that I had in my head every day in my sales career to remind me to always do the th little things that the other people wouldn't do so that one day I could do things that they couldn't do. It was those little things when they were out, and you can ask my wife, we used to do what I call night cruising. So I'm selling cars in the daytime, and my customers would come in, this is pre-internet, and they'd say, I'm looking for a four-door automatic, this, this, whatever, and we don't have one. So I would write it down on a clipboard, and at nighttime, we'd put the kids in the back of the van watching a movie, and we'd drive from lot to lot to lot to lot, and I'm searching to find the car that matches my customer, and I have a whole list of them. And nobody else would do that. But I had it in my head that I had to do this to succeed. And you know what? It, it worked. I got three or four extra car deals a month. And I was, very often I was the top sales guy. I, 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 I just studied self, self-motivation, doing it on my own strength for so many years in this whole world of, I society. And I had various degrees of success. I remember one time we were in Florida. We had won a trip. And they brought me up on the stage in Florida and started counting out these $100 ugly green bills. The Canadian ones are prettier, right? <laughs> Handing me these bills. And then they gave me this big diamond ring. And, and I, you know, was like, ah, me, I did it. Paul, you can do it, right? How many times do we do that? Try to do things on our own strength. So, after 25 years there, I realized that 
And again, me telling God we're doing a Mother's Day sermon uh, reminded me of that world. But from there to here was the cross. I died to myself when I went to the cross. I gave my life to the Lord. Isn't that what we do? Haven't we given him our lives? I no longer serve me and my selfish desires. I've crossed over, pardon the pun, crossed over to his society. And as a servant of God, I need to consider God in everything I do. The word says, hold every thought even captive to the Lord. I'm his servant. I need to go before God and say, Lord, what do you have for us for today? And remove my selfish, I society way of thinking. Amen? So God made me wait. And guess what the service is about today? Waiting. Waiting upon the Lord. Let's go to Isaiah 40. We're just going to read Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. And I brought my glasses, but I wrote it so big. (laughs) I don't think I need them. Have you not known, it says, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? I'm just going to stop and comment on that. God never is weak. He never gets tired. He's never weary. Okay? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I want to unpack a couple of the words in here. Number one is wait. It's, it's interesting. It says here that not even the young guys, so you youth full of energy and vigor uh, versus us older guys that get tired really quickly, but even the youth shall get weary on their own strength. But God never gets tired, and God gives us the strength to do the things he's asked us to do. Amen? So let's talk about Wait. And I know what weight means in Jamaica. And I know what weight means in Canada. And I know what weight means in the doctor's office. It's just kind of one of these, right? You just kind of wait. You kind of do nothing. And I thought, I don't really understand that. How does sitting around doing nothing renew my strength in the Lord? So I thought, you know, I'm going to look it up in Hebrew and see what it says in the Hebrew. Now, I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't know if you can see that. But that's weight in the Hebrew language. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but I can't explain it. What weight means, it's a time of weaving your life together with the Lord. It is a time You're actually doing something. It's not the Jamaican waiting or the Canadian waiting or the Mexican waiting or our kind of waiting. It's actually, you're actually doing something and you're intertwining your life with God. Every aspect of your life. It is a time where you are pressing into the Lord. You are praying. You're worshiping. You're praising. You're getting together in community to build up your strength. You're speaking in tongues. This is the time of waiting in the Hebrew language. We are hanging out with the Holy Spirit. And and I thought about when I was preparing, I was asking God, I was praying more than I ever did before in that time where God was making me wait for him to give me the message. And I understood what the Hebrew version of this word wait means to wait upon the Lord to renew your strength because we're, we're, we're involving God in everything we do and God is always strong. He never gets tired. And when your God asks you to do something, he 
will provide the strength you need to do what he's asked you to do, and you will not grow weary. Amen? If you agree with me, say amen. amen. Now, it mentioned eagles, and I found that a little bit fascinating. This is kind of a little bit of a sidetrack. Karen Kingsbury, a great writer, talks about eagles in one of her books. And she says here, and I'm only going to mention the eagles because that verse mentioned the eagles. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. It says, an eagle uses strong winds and storms to its advantage, soaring high in the skies above clouds and enemies. When they are affected with poison, they fly to a rock and spread their wings, letting the warm rays from the sun renew their strength. Interesting. And sun is S-O-N in this version. Strength from above onto this bird that has been touched but with poison, and he gets his strength from above. Very interesting. Partially through an eagle's life, he goes through a process called a molting process. So this is a time where eagles are very depressed. Uh, calcium deposits appear on the eagle's talons and beak. This is a wilderness time that the, all eagles go through this. And during this time, the eagle begins to walk like a turkey. He has no strength to fly. Other eagles who've already gone through the molting process and survived, they'll fly high above the valley in which the eagle is in and drop fresh food to help strengthen him. Unfortunately, some eagles will not accept the help of the other eagles. They have a choice. Some eagles just choose not to accept it. And they die in the valley, while other eagles will accept the health and therefore regain their strength. Once they recover their strength, they will climb the mountain in which they were raised on. And after this experience, the eagle will soar again with greater strength than ever before. Did you know that? I had no idea. And how interesting that in God's word, he mentions the eagles getting their strength from above. But the eagles have to choose, right? Think about it from an eagle's perspective. They're on the ground, they're weak, they're dying, and food is appearing, being dropped from heaven. God set this in, in place for these eagles to go through this process. And the ones that choose to accept the strength from above are the ones that soar higher and stronger than ever before. And those that choose not to, die. They try to do it on their own strength over here in I society, rather than accepting the strength from above. Amen? I found that very, very fascinating that these eagles are mentioned in this scripture. I want to talk about a couple of amazing men of God from the Bible, a couple of Bible stories, and we can't read them because they're too long, so I'm just going to paraphrase as best I can. And these are a couple of men that demonstrated immense strength. And the first guy I want to talk about is a guy named Job. And you can get your Bible and you can read the whole story of Job. It's a very long uh, story but I'll paraphrase it in my own words as best I can. So Job was a righteous man. He was a man of God. He had woven his life together with the Lord. He was known for his righteousness. He was also an incredibly blessed man. He was wealthy. He was the wealthiest man in the East, is what they called him. And he had it all. And he had this ongoing relationship with the Lord. And the story says that at one point, the angels gathered before the Lord, and along with them came Satan. And so the Satan, God says to Satan, what are you doing? He says, well, you know, I'm roaring around like a lion, looking who I can devour and creating havoc and amongst people. And, and God kind of got to bragging a little bit. He said, well, have you seen my son Job? Job, Job, Job. He's bragging about Job. And Satan says, yeah, but you know, you've got this fence around Job and I can't get anywhere near him. So no wonder he's righteous and he's you know you can brag on him and god says well i'll tell you what i'll take the fence down and i'll let you at him you can go at him but you cannot touch him the man so the devil goes to job and starts to destroy everything in job's life all his wealth 
All his, his cattle, his land got taken away from him. He went from being the richest to having absolutely nothing. And then the enemy went after his family. The story says that his kids were all together having a celebration in a house and the devil caused the house to crumble and kill all of his children. And even after all that, Job remained faithful. Job was strong in the Lord. And if you read the story, you'll, you'll hear how Job, during this waiting period, Job was praying and calling out to the Lord. He was praying, he said in one of his prayers, I would have been better to have gone right from the womb, right to the grave, than to go through this. He had a lot of questions for the Lord, but he never questioned the Lord. And that's important. So the devil goes back to God and he says, I bet if you took off the other fence and let me touch him, he would turn on you. And God says, okay, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. So then the enemy comes back at Job and now he attacks his health. And Job gets sick and Job is in pain. And Job, in the la one of the last scenes, he's there and his friends have all come to him and they've all turned their backs on God. What are you doing? Look what's happening to you. And they've completely turned their backs. And finally, in one of the last scenes, Job's wife comes. And there's Job. He's in pain. He looks pathetic. He's got a rock and he's scraping his skin, the sores and scabs on his skin, scraping them. And his wife looks at him and, you know, in a wifely way like this. <laughs> pathetic. She goes, why don't you just curse God and die? And I want to read to you what Job says. Job says, Job 27, verse 3 through 6. Let's read this together. He says, As long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, wow, my lips will not say anything wicked and my tongue will not utter lies. I will never... I will never admit that you guys are right till I die. I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain. Job just stood faithful. He said, as long as God's breath is in my nostrils, I will never turn my back on God. And I, I read that story and I'm just thinking, what, where does his strength come from? How many of us could have endured what he endured and remained faithful? And I'm telling you, none of us could do it without the strength of God. Amen. This man prayed and prayed and he wove every... The Bible says, keep every thought captive to the Lord. Every thought. Paul says, pray without ceasing. When you do that... You are winding yourself up. This, this weight word, the, the analogy they gave is like a rope of many strings that's just woven together or braided together and it becomes really strong. It's God's strength that pulled Job through that. And guess what the great part was? The enemy was defeated. The devil couldn't get him because he was strong in Christ. Isn't that amazing? The devil couldn't get him. I love that. And the story ends on a happy note. God restored twice his wealth. He had seven boys after that time. He had three girls. He lived another 140 years and saw four generations of children. And the devil gave up trying to get Job. In 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, he walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. He can't devour everybody. He's looking to see who is weak, who is living in I society, trying to do things on their own strength that I can devour. Because those that are intertwined and woven together with the almighty God, he can't touch them. He can't touch them. And I had lots of success over here, lots of reasons to pound my chest. But what you don't know is I had seven 
failed business attempts over here as well. And over here on our own with our New Year's resolutions in I Society, we fail way more times than we succeed trying to do things on our own strength. But with the strength of God, we can defeat the enemy. I'm kind of getting away from my notes here a little bit, but praise, let the spirit go. I, I'm just remembering, remember Jesus when he was taken to be tempted by Satan, right? And Satan tried to use the word against him. And he said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down because the word says that you won't strike your foot against a stone. Sorry if I'm not getting this exactly perfect, but it's just, and what did Jesus do? First thing he did was he said, it is written. He went right to the word and he said, it is written not to test the Lord your God. His strength was in his father. The Holy Spirit in him gave him strength and he defeated the enemy. The enemy tried again. He said, uh, what was the second one? There was the, oh, uh, if, you, if you're the son of God, tell this rock to become bread so you have something to eat. And, and Jesus, again, the first words out of his mouth, it is written. He went right to the scripture and said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. And he defeated the enemy in the strength of his father, the Holy Spirit. And we get to do the same. Amen? If you like that, say amen. You guys are way too quiet today. All right, so since I've gone off my notes, I've lost track. Okay, the next man of God I want to talk about one more is Joseph. And again, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here with Joseph. Joseph was a young man, youngest of 11 kids. And his father favored him because he had him when he was a really old man. And uh, his brothers knew that Joseph was the favorite. And uh, they didn't like that Joseph was the favorite. And Joseph, God promised Joseph that one day in a dream, he promised him that he would rule over his brothers. And Joseph got to bragging about, hey, I'm going to rule over you guys. And they didn't like that. So they decided to, initially they were going to kill him. They threw him in a well. Then they decided not to have blood stains on their hands. Let's pull him out of the well. And they sold him into slavery. And Joseph ended up in Potiphar's house. He, God showed him great favor. If you read the story of Joseph, you'll read that everything Joseph did prospered. He was a man entangled, entwined, woven with God, and everything he did prospered. He had great favor of the Lord. He was this young, handsome, striking guy. Potiphar's wife threw herself at him, he, being a righteous man, rejected her. So then she accused him, and he ended up in jail. Now think about Joseph in jail. God made him wait for two years before he fulfilled the promise. He sat in jail for two years waiting. I had to wait for two weeks for this message, and I was starting to sweat. <laughs> two years waiting in relationship with God and remained faithful. And as we know at the end of the story, of course, God was faithful. He waited on the promise and he received the promise. He ended up second in command. His brother had to bow to him in the story. And there are many other great men and women of the Bible. Moses had to wait 40 years. And if you read the story of Moses again, you'll find during this waiting period, this Hebrew version of wait, Moses never stopped talking to God, right? What are we waiting for? Somebody tell me what we are waiting for right now. Are we not all waiting for Jesus to return? We are waiting. And what are we doing while we're waiting? Is it Jamaican waiting just kind of? No. We're worshiping. We're praising. We are getting together on Sundays, Tommy Tuesdays, youth groups, we are getting together and we are stronger as we wait upon the Lord, the Hebrew style of wait, praying, praising, speaking in tongues, worshiping God. Amen? Amen. It's a different kind of waiting. Moses, 40 years. Abraham waited 25 years. Noah waited for the flood. Mary, Martha waited for the resurrection. The disciples had to wait on the Holy Spirit. And it's important as you wait you know, 
The enemy will get you if you don't know the word. If you don't know what God has promised you, he can roar around like the lion and you're going to be the weak one trying to do things over here on your own strength rather than waiting on the Lord and getting hit the strength from him. Be like the eagles, accept the strength falling from above. Amen? And we get stronger. So uh, it's a short message today, but I do want to go over some of the promises of God because it's so important. And some of these in my prayer life, I'm always praying them. You have to understand this. Um, Isaiah 41 says, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am God and I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you in my righteous right hand. That is a promise from God. Father, you said that you would always be with me. You said you would hold me up with your righteous right hand. You said you would be my strength. That's a different kind of prayer, isn't it? Philippians 4.19, my God will supply every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Does anybody here have need? Is anybody here worried about finances or any kind of need? You need to know this promise or the enemy will get you. You need to understand, God has promised to supply your every need. Wow. Wow. And here's one of my all-time favorites. is Hebrews 13. And I say this all the time in my prayers. Lord, even to be here today. I'm coming here today, God. This is your service. It's your children. You know who's coming, and it's your word. And you promised me that you would never leave me or forsake me. Man, what a promise from God. We have to understand and know that promise. Amen? He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You are never alone. The God of all strength is always with you. And he's promised to give you his strength in your time of need. He's asked you to do something and he will provide the strength you need to do it. Amen? And you will defeat the enemy every time as long as you wait upon the Lord and your strength will rise. We sing about it, don't we? Strength will rise as we wait. I won't sing. Sorry, I won't sing. I won't embarrass my wife and sing. What about this one in Psalm 84? It says, No good thing does he withhold from those who walk upright. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, that you withhold nothing. And, and here's another huge one to me. A promise of God. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And we just saw it. He couldn't get Job. He couldn't get Jesus. Jesus knew the promise. Job knew who his God was. And he resisted and he defeated the enemy. The enemy has no power over you and I. None whatsoever. As long as we're waiting on the Lord, the Hebrew style with his strength, amen? God is way stronger than the devil. So resist the devil and he will flee from you. Psalm 50 says, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. This is a promise, church. This is a promise from God. Call upon me in your day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. I love that one because over here in I society, who do you think I glorified, right? It was all about me. I did it. I set goals. I achieved. I, 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 I. Me, me, me. God says, I will deliver you and you will glorify me. We are servants. We humble ourselves before him and we, we acknowledge, Lord, I am weak. I can't do this without you. But you said... And then you go ahead and quote that promise for your situation. Whatever it is you're going through, find the promise of God that applies to it. And go to the Father and pray and say, Lord, you said you would supply my every need. You promised, Lord, you would never leave me. I love Pepe's analogy last week with the ice cream. Promise your kid an ice cream. They won't forget. And they have no problem coming to you and saying, Daddy, you said I could have an ice cream. 
over and over and over again. And that's okay. So we have to know the promises, we have to know the word, and we'll defeat the enemy. Amen? And remember what Paul said. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We live for him. Amen? Isaiah 54 promises that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. No weapon. There's nothing the enemy can do to defeat you when you walk and wait with the Lord. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and not to harm you. These are promises of God. And we need to know the word, church, family. We need to know the promises of God. Amen? And admit that we are weak. We can't do it without him. So many times I've, you know, tried to go on diets and done New Year's resolutions. And I always go, yep, I'm going to do it this year. I'm going to go to the gym three times a week. I want to look like Ben. I'm going to, right? I'm going to get that six-pack back that I haven't seen in 30 years. And I'm going to the gym and I'm going to do this in my own strength. And six months later, it's not happening. But what if I went to God and I said, Lord, you told me that this body was the temple of the Lord. You said to me that I am to honor you with my body. And from that perspective, for those reasons, I want to take care of it. You said to take care of what, I, what you've given me. I want to take care of this temple of God. It's a totally different mindset going before the Lord and asking him to help me to do what he's asked me to do, to honor God with my body. When temptation comes your way, when, when the, the draw of pornography is trying to pull you or addiction or, or alcohol or all the weapons the enemy is pulling on you, you turn to God and say, God, I need you. I am weak. I can't defeat that on my own strength, my own will. I need your strength and then know the promise. Know the promise that he's promised you that he will deliver you. He will hold you up with his right hand. Amen?